Hey everyone, good to see you. I'm Rena Ninen, and we're in the CBS This Morning Toyota Green Room with CNET senior producer Dan Patterson, who is my guru for all things in tech, the ultimate tech insider, I, I find. And we're going to talk a little bit about the digital currency, Bitcoin, and the technology behind it called blockchain, which kind of blows people's mind. It's hard to understand. So can you just give us sort of the basic spiel on what exactly is blockchain? Hey, good morning, Rena. So that is the age old question. What is blockchain? So um, if you think about your, do you remember checkbooks or when you log into your bank website or load an app on your phone, you see a ledger of every transaction. And the word ledger is kind of key. You'll hear jargon saying, oh, blockchain is a distributed ledger. That doesn't really explain things, but what it means is that every transaction that happens with the cryptocurrency, Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies is logged for the public to see and access. And you might say, okay, so what? Well, every transaction being logged means that they are encrypted with this very special technology. The technology that enables blockchain really is new, it is novel, and there are ways that we can take all of the transactions. So instead of thinking about your bank account, think about all of the bank accounts that exist. There are probably millions or hundreds of millions of transactions that happen every day. So with the blockchain, each one of these blocks of transactions is released every five or 10 minutes to the public. And what this means is that the metadata, the time, date, and the different types of activity are also logged. Now, the fact that this is encrypted means that it can't be altered, it can't be changed, and that you can imprint certain things on there. Again, this all sounds like jargon, but what that really means is that stuff like your medical transactions or different types of, of things that we might want private, but we also want other entities like a healthcare provider to own or to interact with can be, uh, we can exchange those things, right? So I can own and control my healthcare records, but I can allow my HMO or my doctor to interact with that record. I love how you compare Bitcoin to kind of, up to blockchain to kind of looking at other people's checkbooks. I like the idea of seeing what other people are doing with their checkbooks. Um, but how exactly is Bitcoin revolutionizing other industries? Well, I don't know that it is. We hear all of this hype, right? And that's really the hype to uh, practicality ratio is like 10 to one. Mm -hmm. So uh, there are industries, especially healthcare. I love looking at healthcare because that is something we can all understand. My healthcare records are my records. They have to do with my health, but I might want someone else to be able to interact with those things. Uh, other industries are really taking to blockchain though, like financial services. So we hear about fintech, that also sounds like jargon, but if you think about something like Venmo, mm -hmm. right, where I can seamlessly, very easily send cash between different people. I don't have to think about what's happening on the back end, I can just send cash. Well, mm -hmm. if we have a consortium of banks, meaning every bank that you or I may use, it's way easier if we have blockchain technology that enables us to send or receive large sums of money. So I get that it can send and receive large sums of money, but how do you think it can change the way regular folks live and deal with money? That is still up for debate. Okay. And, and I, I believe in the potential technology and the, the potential uses of this technology, but I have yet to see, and I've been looking at the blockchain space for over five years, and I've yet to see something that really is applicable for normal everyday people. And that's something to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a difference between blockchain tech and cryptocurrency. Mm -hmm. Cryptocurrency like Bitcoin, or you'll hear of Ethereum or Ripple, all of these are different incentive mechanisms. So the blockchain works by pointing a lot of processing power at particular code. The code, the blockchain code, uh, is it requires that we solve these very complex math problems. So the more processing power that you throw at these, mm -hmm. the better you are at solving these problems. That will then release a Bitcoin or an Ethereum, a piece of ether, right? Okay. The, these different chains have different names. So Ripple will, will release uh, a different type of currency. That incentivizes people to make the chain stronger by mining it, by pointing your very powerful processor at that. 
you know, it's like this black hole when we talk about cryptocurrency. It's kind of hard to wrap your head around. It is. Do you find that cryptocurrency is practical or is this just sort of a speculative market? It's very speculative right now. Uh, the practical uses for cryptocurrency right now, the way it is bought and sold and spent yeah. is primarily on the dark web. The dark web is the encrypted internet. You need a special browser called Tor to visit the dark web. And the services that you can use cryptocurrency for are primarily illegal activities. So when we talk about things that are very practical, all of that kind of stays in the realm of the abstract and the hy hypothetical. Uh, the one way that I see cryptocurrency being used right now, and it kind of gives me some anxiety, is if we look at Venezuela. The economy is tanking and people are dumping their cash money into cryptocurrencies. This may be more of a, a symptom of a bad economy than it is a, an indicator that cryptocurrency is the real deal. You know, one of the key words that comes up when you're trying to understand blockchain is decentralization of data. What does that mean? So uh, decentralization of data, it, it's almost impossible to talk about the blockchain without using jargon. Uh, so what this means is instead of a bank controlling your currency, your yeah. money, it is locked to the blockchain. So you can have proof that this coin is authentic and it's a part of the chain, right? So instead of having a bank say, yes, your dollars or your credits in your account are real, you have a decentralized authority. Now this becomes very powerful again when we look at medical records, right? Instead of having one organization take care of uh, the ownership of my med medical records, and this can be problematic, especially when we look at all these hacks and uh, you know data leaks, Equifax last year, a lot of personal information was leaked to the public. Having this stored in an encrypted way in the blockchain makes a lot of sense because it's decentralized. But we've heard this language before. I'm a big believer in open source and decentralization, but we look at, you know, just 10 years ago, what happened with RSS and OPML. These, again, are coding languages that promised a decentralized internet, and yet everything becomes closed. So anytime we talk about decentralization, especially with the blockchain, we can look at what's already happening. There's Bitcoin, but there's also Ripple, Ethereum, all of these other chains that are closed and private. You know, Tim Berners-Lee, the man who invented the internet, um, he says that blockchain could actually really help in pushing back against tech giants like Google and might restore internet to the way he initially envisioned it. Can you sort of explain the thinking behind that? And do you buy that? Uh, I don't know that I buy it. I, I buy the vision and I understand why Tim Berners-Lee would say this. Uh, and I think many people who are in the tech space kind of have this uh, uh, vision of a web that is open and free and that is not the reality that we've ever encountered. So uh, the internet used to be, you know, we use HTTP, right? And when you put that into your browser, that stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol. And all of this are open ways, open source, meaning uh, no one company owns this way of communicating. And HTTP is a way of telling a web browser, hey, go to this IP address and load this website. Mm. That's great. Email, also an open protocol. You don't need Gmail. You don't need uh, Microsoft Outlook. Those are private ways of doing an email protocol, mm. SMTP. I understand why Tim Berners-Lee wants this. Mm -hmm. And we see a history of the web where innovators look at open source and they say, hey, let's make all of these protocols that can interoperate with each other. And then we see the Facebooks of the world, the Googles of the world, the Twitters of the world say, hey, great idea, let's privatize it and make some money on it. Mm. You know, this week we know that Facebook came forward and talked about a disinformation campaign dealing with potentially the midterms. Do you think blockchain could have made a difference with that? Um, Yes and no. So everything, again, with blockchain is hypothetical. Mm -hmm. One of the great hypothetical uses of blockchain is the media industry. So we saw in 2016, not just meddling with uh, bots and other things that kind of propped up uh, some candidates, we also saw the spread of what we call now fake news. Mm -hmm. Now, we can't prevent anyone from setting up a, a fake website and disseminating fake information, but right now a massive trend that we see Google, Twitter, and Facebook engaging in is verifying information. And verification is the key to the blockchain. Again, because the, the way the code is written, you can verify that a piece of not just currency, a piece of Bitcoin, 
but other information, you can verify that this is authentic and real. So mm. if we take a photo here at CBS News or the New York Times or anywhere else, or we write a story, we could imprint that on a news chain, uh, a fork of the blockchain or, or any other type of, of blockchain technology, and then be able to say this is authentic, it is the date stamp, the, the date and time stamp is real, the author's byline is real. Mm -hmm. So at the very least you can say, well this is major media that has been reported and verified accurate, but that also kind of prevents uh, legitimate bloggers or smaller pieces of independent media from rising to the top. And so you end up with a, a segregated internet. This is again a theoretical use. Segregated internet. Fascinating to hear you talk about blockchain and the many uses. Dan Patterson, I want to thank you so much for joining us. I want to thank all of you out there on Facebook for joining us as well. Thank you.